I'm Mark Smelly Bell. I'm here with Nsima Inyang and Zach Bitter, and we're going to talk today about running. I feel like I was too fat to run, especially many years ago, but I have gotten into some walk running lately. How does someone like, I think Nsima, you could take this away here because you were mentioning something good before we started recording about somebody uh, maybe having a certain distance that they want to run that's like low hanging fruit for someone who's just getting started. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things is when I look at you and like the way you walk and the way you run, it's like you have such good body mechanics. And I think as lifters, as strength athletes, I don't think it would be a drawback for us to be able to run one mile without getting gassed. I, mean, I don't think it would take a backup on our strength. So I think that it would be good for our conditioning. So my question to you is what do you think would be the simplest first steps for a strength athlete that wants to get themselves into running? Like, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the simplest progression into that for someone who's like, I can't even run a fourth of a mile without getting myself winded? Yeah, it's a great question. I think like, when I think of how I would maybe program for someone like that, I think of just like, what do we have our like, high school or middle school track and cross country guys and gals doing during the summer as mm -hmm. they're preparing for the specifics of the season. And that's gonna be a lot of like foundational stuff, uh, a lot of kind of lower intensity stuff, which I think would pair up well for folks who are new, folks who are more into strength power sports, where they've kind of fine tuned that side of the spectrum a little bit and just need to kind of build an aerobic foundation that they can actually build their primary sport off of if they want to kind of focus on that more specifically. Uh, or if they decide at that point, hey, I'm really starting to love this, I'm going to actually see how fast I can run a 5K, they can build off of that. So no matter what direction they end up wanting to go with it, it's going to be useful for them. Mm -hmm. So I think the programming you want to do with this would be, some folks will call it like a maximum aerobic function training process, where you're kind of limiting yourself where I'm not going to go above a certain intensity. Some okay. will use heart rate for that. Uh, I'll call it like the end, or like you peak your, your running intensity at where the high end of easy would be before you'd enter like a moderate pace. Mm -hmm. You can define that by a heart rate. Uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone has popularized a training method called maximum aerobic function, mm -hmm. where he's got a formula where you take 180 minus your age, and essentially that's the heart rate you want to stay under. You want to stay like within a few beats of that, but under it. And you just train at that intensity, and Let that's going to, yeah. Quick, would you be able to gauge it by like how you're going to be able to speak while running? Because like mm -hmm. a lot of runners, yep. they'll keep a pace that they can like hold a conversation with somebody. Perfect. So for someone yeah. like us who like we run and we get winded, would mm -hmm. we just keep a pace where Mark and I could hold a decent conversation while running? Would that be a good gauge? Yeah, and this would be a great time to have a running buddy too, because you can actually have a conversation with them, mm -hmm. and if you notice all right, I can't maybe string together multiple sentences without having to catch my breath, but I can say a sentence or two to Mark and then catch my breath while he's answering and then go back and feel comfortable doing that. Mm. That's a pretty good gauge. Uh, another one that folks will sometimes use, is, especially as they're looking, if they're looking at breathing techniques too, is uh, limit yourself by breathing in your nose, out your mouth. If you're going too fast to be able to talk, get enough oxygen to do that, mm -hmm. you're probably overshooting or you're getting close to overshooting, so maybe slow down a bit. And where I think this, where people uh, sometimes beat themselves up too much is they look at not being able to run the entire time as, uh, as somehow like indication that they're not good at it or they need to quit or that, that, that you know, I'm just not meant for this. When in reality, a lot of people are there and whether you're walking or running isn't as big of a deal as long as you're kind of getting your heart rate up near that level. So you don't necessarily want to let it drip down too far. If you just walk the whole way and it's sitting at like 110, then you maybe aren't quite running hard enough, but being willing to slow down and walk as you kind of creep up, let's say 150 is your ceiling, you're not gonna to try to go above 150 beats per minute, mm -hmm. or you're gonna maintain your breathing through your nose, out your mouth. When you hit that spot where you're either going over that 150 or you're forcing yourself to breathe through your mouth because it's too hard not to, then just back off, even that means walking. And if you really wanna get kind of specific at the individual level with that, and progress check and be able to think to yourself, okay, I'm making progress and get that motivation. Pay attention to kind of how you start. Maybe that first time you go out for a mile and in that mile you spend 400 meters of that jogging slow and 1200 meters of that walking. Now maybe after the end of the first week, now you've got that up to 600 meters of running, 1000 meters of walking, mm -hmm. interspersed as needed. And you're seeing this progress, you're making gains. And I think focusing on those gains relative to where you started is what's gonna kind of keep people motivated and get them where they want to be, where eventually, oh, now I can just go out and jog two miles, no problem, no walking breaks, mm. keep my heart rate at a decent level without going too high, carry that conversation, breathe in your nose, out your mouth. 
Uh, that's kind of the baseline. And then from there, you can look at, well, what's your goal there? So uh, you can go one of two directions. One is I'm comfortable with this level of aerobic fitness or this foundation. I'm going to start implementing maybe some speed sessions, some sprint intervals, some strides or something like that. Or you can say, I want to build up my tolerance at this intensity and start pushing out the volume you do. So maybe you decide when you get to be able to do two miles, you know what, three miles sounds better. I'm going to work up to three miles. And uh, you, know, you start improving from that metric where uh, rather than trying to introduce speed to the equation, introducing more volume at the same intensity so you can tolerate a bigger training load at that lower intensity of work. Um, and a lot of times, like with a with a like a, a foundational or base training plan, depending on where a person's at, will determine kind of like what makes a good foundation before they want to kind of move on to whatever their priority is, and then going back to that and maybe building on it down the road at a different training cycle. Uh, with a lot of new runners or summer training programs near the end, if you look at it like 12 weeks, maybe by the eighth week, we start introducing some, some speed work where it's like, we're not gonna put that heart rate limitation or that breathing limitation on you the entire time. Mm -hmm. We might introduce 20 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe up to 30 minutes or so where you're running at an intensity that uh, lets your heart rate get up a little higher. Yeah. Uh, it, think of it like an intensity. If you were to just run a consistent pace for an hour or do an activity at a consistent effort for an hour, what would that pace be? Uh, so, you know, you speed up to that. Uh, there's different heart rate metrics you can use with that one too. A lot of times like it would be like maybe 83 to 88% of your max heart rate is kind of a good starting point for that. Uh, you can do a time trial if you want to do it the hard way, I guess a, a painful way to figure out where your pace would be at a 60 minute time trial. Um, yeah, so there's different ways to kind of figure that one out too, but really just introducing some small amount of speed work and sometimes that over speed training can kind of raise the, your aerobic capacity a little bit. So if you find yourself plateauing at that, you know, that easy pace where you're using that heart rate breathing or conversation metrics to kind of gauge, um, you know, if you see a plateau there, you can try to pull it far forward a little bit or break through that plateau with a little bit of speed work. I think there's two major things that hold a lot of people back from running. One is thinking about like how far they need to run. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we know like you're going to go outside for like a run and you hear somebody say they ran five miles mm -hmm. or you hear somebody say they ran three miles. <clears throat> and so it sounds too much to like yeah. overcome, but we don't realize what you said is we can run, walk, we can run as slow as we want. Mm -hmm. And I've even, for myself personally, have taken it from even, I don't even really think about running. Um, I just do something that's a little faster than walking, which I call a jog mm -hmm. or a trot. You know, it's just like, I'm just moving. And then now I've gotten into like going a little faster. But I think another thing that holds people back, um, aside from, you know, the consistency uh, and the duration of it is the pain like running I think a lot of us associate running with pain when yes. I think about like my uh, when I played football or when I played some other sports I got hurt more running than I did kind of doing anything else I mean yeah. I would smash people in football and slam my head into somebody else or whatever mm -hmm. and it seemed like that didn't bother me nearly as much as even just something like sprinting so yeah. how do we avoid injury with running that's a really good question and I think it, it kind of makes sense when you think it through because when you get hurt from slow running or endurance running it tends to be a combination of everything you've done you get these overuse issues so by the time it happens it's like you didn't have enough warning until it's way too late. Mm -hmm. Whereas in football, you know, you decide to, you know, run straight into the strongest linebacker on the field and get knocked, knocked backwards. You learn right then and there, you don't do that again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, there's like these, uh, you know, these more like real distinct, clear, no go zones when you get into higher intensity stuff where you learn pretty quick. And, uh, if you learn, you don't do too much damage versus the cumulative, overuse stuff that you're going to develop from like a tendonitis issue or something like that or you know whatever happens stress fractures and things like that from just the, the continued repetitive motion of running so i think the, there's two mistakes i see people oftentimes make that get them in that one is like what you alluded to they are talking to a friend and it's like oh i just went a five mile run it felt great They're like okay five mile run feel great i'm going to have that experience they do the five mile run they feel terrible so it's you have to individualize it at that point it's totally fine to say, hey, my friend can run five miles and feel good doing it. I want that. But you have to be patient in the sense that uh, it might take time to get to that. So just like if 
if I decided, oh, Mark and Seema here, they look really strong. I want to be like that. It's going to take me some time to get anywhere near that. So I need to be patient with myself and work from where I'm at. Because if I try to get to where they're at overnight, I'm going to end up pinned underneath a bar with a lot of weight on it in a lot of trouble. Just like the runner who decides to run five miles faster than they can tolerate before they're ready for it is going to find themselves hating it, not wanting to do it again, and then ultimately quitting. The other thing I see is when the, with running is they'll be really ambitious early and they'll overstress or what I call macro stress because they're so excited. And when that, when it, when they're doing too much of it because of that early motivation, once that early motivation fades, now all of a sudden they're like, oh, now I'm doing less. And that's a negative feedback loop that's going to make it more likely for them to want to quit or think, oh, I'm not good at this. I'm done or bring it, welcome an injury. And, uh, yeah, so never worry about doing too little, especially if you're just getting started. If you're just getting started, you've done no running. So even if you're running for a total of 30 minutes in a week within the context of your walk run, if the running portion of that walk run is 30 minutes in a week, that's a 30 minute training load that you did not have before. Yes. So that is actually gonna probably produce a growth benefit for you. And then you know if you let that absorb, and then you go out, that 30 minutes will turn to 45, to 60, to, to 90, to two hours. You know, before you know it, you're that guy running five miles and feeling good about it and telling your friends and getting them motivated to head out and do it. So never be afraid to scale back. If you feel miserable during it, it's probably a good sign that you should slow down a bit or give you more time between sessions. So the other thing I think people will do is like running is an activity where it's pretty easy just to head out and do, like if you wanna force yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. So they get in this concept of every day, no mm -hmm. days off. Whereas, you know, a lot of successful running programs for people who are new are doing three days a week. So they may have a day off after every run. So they may have 48 hours plus between each one of their sessions. And what that oftentimes does is rather than going in one day feeling great about themselves, cool, I did it, now I just gotta do it again tomorrow. And then have that gradual depreciation of the motivation it gets more and more miserable. They're actually getting slower because they're doing too much and not mm. recovering it. They go from one run to the next being excited to do it. I'm fresh, I'm ready to go, I recovered, I'm ready. And then that just kind of spirals in a positive direction. And then they can increase load over time and get to the spot they want to be. Let me ask both you guys this. Um, what do you think about intentionally not becoming all that efficient at running? Because for someone like Ensema, if you're like, hey man, we're gonna get you, you know, really adapted to running and uh, we're going to make you super efficient at running. I know you'd be great at it. If you did that, then he would probably lose some size and lose some muscle if he spent, a, if he invested a lot of time and energy and ran every day for miles and miles. So uh, it's my belief that it's kind of good to just stay on the fringe of this and just get a little bit of running in and get some of the metabolic benefits. I believe I'm going to be able to have a good body transformation, still hold on to a lot of muscle mass, still do a lot of the stuff I love to do in the gym. Uh, just as long as I don't go too overboard with the running. Yeah, and this is a great topic because here we have three guys that have a performance goal, right? You guys are performance goals are in the weight room. I um, thought you were going to say three guys that are clearly a 10 out of 10. I was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, you know, I'm aware of that. <clears throat> but I think that's interesting because it's a different conversation versus the person who's like, hey, I'm really interested in health and fitness. Uh, I want to kind of be a jack of all trades. I don't want to suck at anything but I don't need to be great at anything either. I just need to not get my butt kicked to be a dead last, whether I go into the weight room, whether I go on the soccer field, whether I go for an easy run with my friends. Mm. Uh, whereas we're kind of on opposite ends of that where I'm trying to peak for a 100 mile race, which means I'm gonna have to make sacrifices in the weight room in some cases. Whereas you guys are weight room guys, strength guys, physique guys. Uh, you, when you pick a target that you're gonna try to get to, it may take letting go of some of the other end of the spectrum type stuff or minimizing it so that you don't compromise what you're peaking at. So for running for you guys might be, but I think you said it perfectly, Mark, the question you should ask yourself is where is the line where I need to stop? If I go past that, it's going to take away from my gym gains or I'm not going to get the quality session I need to get in on my primary activity. Just like I need to ask myself when I go into the weight room, I need to do the strength work that's going to keep me healthy and strong. But I got to be careful not to get too crazy because if I do such a big workout or get too focused on strength work, then I may find myself in a position where now my short interval sessions are less quality because I'm walking in with tight hamstrings the next day or that sort of thing. So some of it's just what's your priority 
And how do you make sure the primary activity isn't negatively impacted by the supplementary activity, but you're still getting what you're looking for from the supplementary activity? And that's why initially I set the bar so low. Like I want to be able to one, run one to two miles Perfect. and not be dead. Yeah. And I, like, I think that that can be achieved with maybe a frequency of like twice a week, mm -hmm. some easy runs, like some run walks that Mark has talked about. Yep. But that gets into something else because you mentioned something that was really, really important. You kind of talked about how you wouldn't try to go into the gym and just bench 350 right. pounds, yeah. right? <laughs> just like, you know, someone like us, we wouldn't just go out and try to run three to five miles. Mm -hmm. uh, but along with that, you know, a lot of athletes in the gym, they have belts, they have Olympic lifting shoes. They, they try to find the right uh, equipment to help them, you know, do their work. Mm -hmm. And Mark right here, he's wearing these really dope shoes from Ultra. And the really cool thing is like, they're wide at the front, they're narrow at the back, they're great for a wide foot. I grew up wearing narrow soccer cleats and I had to get mm -hmm. surgery on my foot to yeah. shave off a bunny net because my cleats were so narrow. So I imagine if there are powerlifters with fat feet like us and they try to buy your normal running shoes that are pretty narrow or uncomfortable, yeah. they could end up doing some damage to their feet. So mm -hmm. what should they be looking for if now they wanna go try to you know, get some running in, get a mile, two miles in, but they don't know necessarily the type of footwear to look for, for what they're trying to do. Yeah, it's a great question because uh, from an injury prevention standpoint, comfort is gonna be a good identifier, but you also wanna make sure you're picking the right piece of equipment to put you in a position where comfort isn't kind of an illusion where it's comfort in the moment, but long-term it's gonna mechanically put me in a position where I get an overuse injury or mm -hmm. I atrophy something. So. If you think of your shoes kind of as casts, soccer is the tough one because there is some functional purpose of a pointy show, yeah. shoe toe, so you can scoop up under that ball. But outside of that, it's like pretty rare that you would actually need that other than sliding your foot into like a horse, like this, what is the stirrup, right? Stirrup, the sliding, yeah. like other than that, you don't really need a pointy shoe. Mm -hmm. So having a shoe that allows your toes to splay out the same way your fingers do are gonna be just good for like being able to, you know, flex those muscles in your feet and keep them from atrophying. Uh, if you think of your feet and your lower legs the same way as you do any body part in the gym, uh, you wouldn't want to put on a piece of equipment in the gym that's going to cause one of your muscles not to get stronger when you're going through the liftings that you're doing. You want all that stuff to stay on top of itself. Obviously, competition is maybe different. You might use some of that stuff so you can get every last ounce out of you as you're competing against someone. Mm -hmm. Kind of same thing with running. Like There may be uh, opportunities to take advantage of a piece of equipment that otherwise wouldn't be good for you to use all the time in order to eke a little bit of extra competition out of yourself. So when I look at footwear, I think of like firm and uh, like hard type of midsole. Mm -hmm. Some people put their foot in there and they think, okay, that's a little less comfortable. I want to shy away from that. In reality, that firm surface is going to put you in a position where your foot's going to seek out the most ideal spot to plant down because it's really uncomfortable to do it in a different spot. It's really uncomfortable to come banging down on my heel if I have a firm surface that's coming down on. Just take your shoes off and run on, on some concrete or even some sand for that matter and try coming down on your heel. Your body's not even going to let you. It, those nerves in the bottom of your feet are going to be like, uh, nope, nope, not doing that. We're going up on the midfoot. We're going to gravitate towards a spot on my foot that can absorb that underneath the bent knee where it's intended to absorb those impact forces. You want your shoes to put you in a position to do it the same way. So for a lot of people, that might mean a shoe that's a little more firm in some cases. I like shoes that are balanced, meaning that like the heel and the forefoot are the same distance off the ground. When you lift up that heel, what you're doing is you're kind of propping yourself forward a little bit, but not forward in the way where you're just gonna like stay straight. Your body's gonna compensate with that by pushing your posterior chain out and your upper body forward, and that's gonna create little like kinks in the line, so to speak, and that's gonna be where some of those impact forces collect. Runners a lot of times deal with lower back issues, mm. partly because their upper body their pelvic is tilted forward because of their shoe lifting them up or poor form for whatever reason. And that stresses those lower back muscles because it's trying to hold up your upper body versus being in a position where it can support that weight without as much, uh, much effort. Uh, so getting a flat shoe, whether it's high cushioned or low cushioned is kind of a good starting point for a lot of people. Uh, but like anything, you also want to be careful about changing multiple variables. If you've been wearing a highly cushioned, big uh, heel chew for a long, long time. Think of it like you had a cast on your arm. Mm -hmm. If I broke my arm, I'd want a cast on that because I'd want to make sure it heals and gets set right so I don't end up with like a big, you know, you know, crooked arm because I didn't set that bone. Uh, but once that bone heals in the right place, I want to take that cast off and start getting that arm strong again. Yeah. Kind of same thing with your feet. If you remove a supported shoe, highly cushioned shoe, a big lifted shoe, you might want to kind of transition out of that to a degree 
uh, by strengthening those lower feet, by kind of scaling down, like maybe rather than going from a highly cushioned supportive shoe down to a minimalist shoe, you might want to start out with something that's like same amount of cushion, but flat and foot shape. So you can still splay out those toes and start working on kind of correcting some of those muscles there. And you can get in that right posture so you're not causing impact forces to end up in your lower back. But you're also, you have that soft landing zone and you're not changing too many variables at once. Uh, and then kind of working your way down to that if you want to kind of keep going to get really strong lower legs from, from your footwear. Uh, some people just do barefoot running to help with that too. They'll wear a normal pair of shoes. Then they'll, a few miles during the week, they'll go out and they'll run, do some run barefoot running on the on the field. So they'll walk around barefoot. I feel about the vibrance, those uh, five finger shoes. Yeah, so that's kind of like the, I would say the pinnacle of minimalist outside of not wearing any shoe at all. Yeah. So essentially that type of shoe is just a thin slab of rubber, a glove essentially on your foot, um, where those got really popular for a while and the minimalist movement kind of took off like probably about a, almost a decade ago at this point. Mm -hmm. And where they got into problems, in fact, I think they got sued actually. Oh. <laughs> but uh, what happened was you had that situation I just described where people had been in built up supportive shoes, a lot of cushion, a lot of lift, and they went from zero to 100. They basically removed that entire cast and then they went right into their normal routine. So now they did the same amount of training as they were before, but they were exposing muscles that had been protected or casted for years and years to like full on activity, full on range of motion. So they needed to like ease into that. And they, they should have, what people should have done there is rather than jumping right into the vibrant five fingers, they should have put in something that had a little more support and maybe just went to balance cushion mm. or maybe just had foot shape and kind of worked their way down or kept their old shoe in the rotation, brought up the vibrant five fingers and said, okay, I'm gonna start out just walking around in these when I'm not running. Then maybe after a few weeks, I'm going to do my easiest, shortest run of the week in these. And then maybe after a couple of weeks of that, I'm going to do two runs a week. And then if you want to get to a point where you're running exclusively in Vibram Five Fingers or any minimalist shoe, you're giving yourself that that ramp up to it or that same same with the gym, right? You know, I'm not benching 350 pounds tomorrow. It's going to take me years to get to that. So mm -hmm. I need to treat that with respect if I ever want to actually get there. If you want to avoid the lower leg issue injuries, uh, you probably don't want to go from something really built up to something super minimal all, all, all at once. I got a couple really big things from you today. Uh, driving the elbow back was one of them. Um, leaning forward, and you had me kind of lean forward in the gym to the point where I had to put my leg out to stop me. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other one? I lean forward, arms. Oh, and the knees, Yeah, driving with the knees. So mm -hmm. sometimes people will think like, oh man, I need to kind of stride it out. I need to really open up my gait. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were explaining like that might not be in your best interest. A good yeah. way to maybe pull a hammy and a good yeah. way to maybe put too much stress on the knee, right? Yeah, and this actually kind of harkens back to like a time where when running was really pop getting popular, the thought was, well, if I can cover more ground per step, I'm gonna to get to the finish line faster. And it made sense in theory. It's like if you keep that same frequency, that, that same leg turnover, but you're covering an extra three inches, yeah, you're gonna to get to the finish line quicker. Where, where it didn't get kind of figured in was those longer reaches take longer. So you're actually gonna take less steps per minute, lower cadence. And by doing that, you're putting your foot in position where it is gonna bear the weight of impact out in front of your knee. And you're gonna create a locking in your knee when you bear impact and that's going to send those impact forces up the kinetic chain into like your knees and hips versus having like a shorter stride length faster cadence you're much more likely to have that first that knee drive that you talked about and also that higher cadence is going to have that foot is going to be much less likely to reach out in front of your vet knee but come down underneath it then you're using your legs to absorb that impact the way it should be so you're going to get the same impact forces either way the question is where are they going and uh, you know, with that foot coming down on a bent knee, they're gonna get distributed in areas your body was designed to tolerate that. You have your foot out in front of your knee, they're gonna end up in areas where your body wasn't designed to tolerate that load. And then over time, you're gonna have knee and hip issues and other running related injuries from that. So that kind of also fits in with like the firmness of the shoe too, where a more firm shoe is gonna more encourage that precise landing point. So someone who's struggling with that might want a firmer shoe as they're learning it. Once you get your form cleaned up, like someone who's got really good form, probably throw any shoe on them and their mechanics are so ingrained and so dialed in they're still going to have that perfect form and gait even if they have heel lift extra cushion 
so they can maybe leverage more different options than say someone who's learning and trying to get that dialed in. You know, it's great that you kind of mentioned the uh, the knees and the ankles because uh, when I was younger and I played a lot of soccer, mm-hmm. I would get shin splints quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And you know, we had Ben Patrick here. Yeah. Well, one of the things that would actually have mitigated those shin splits have had big tips or big tibialises, yeah. right? Uh-huh. So things like if you guys go and you watch some of the concept they had with Ben, we talked about that, the uh, tibialis raises, the backwards walking for the knees and mm-hmm. all those small workouts for the tips, the calves, the everything around the knees so that you could strengthen your knees. And I think that would also be really mm-hmm. good for if you guys are trying to pick up running like we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think, you know, you don't have to look too far to find the runner with a knee issue, right? And that's the, one of the biggest questions I get is, oh, how do your knees feel? Mm-hmm. And uh, my knees feel fine, but that's partly because I uh, practice form and technique. So a lot of it, and some of it can be genetic too. Like uh, some folks, like no matter what they do, like poor genetics, they're gonna have to have knee surgery at some point for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you could always probably, I mean, Ben's probably the perfect example of this, right? Because he had terrible knees. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to the point where it was like limiting his opportunities within sport and, you know, he was the guy that had the worst of it. And rather than saying, hey, well, that's my reality. I can't use my knees this way. I need to fo- focus on an activity I can or just, you know, go go a different route. He's like, I'm going to make that weakness something I can improve on and strengthen. And he found those workouts and those supplementary activities as a to strengthen that area. So now he can tolerate that training load and that, that mechanic and stuff. And. Now the dude's like jumping off ladders and stuff. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, if you felt previously that you were too fat to run, you don't have an excuse anymore. So he gave you all the details on how to get it done. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later.